My name is Steve Higgins, and I'm joined by my partner, Allison Schmidt. We are the financial advisors here at HD Wealth Strategies. As part of our effort to bring timely information to our clients, we seek out thought leaders to help bring clarity to our investment strategies for your benefit. With us today is Dominic Alto, a portfolio manager for Thornburg Investment Management. Dominic serves as a liaison between Thornburg's portfolio management team and key investment decision makers. He communicates the firm's processes and results of the investment strategies Thornburg manages. Today, we're going to talk specifically about municipal bonds. Dom, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank, Thank you, you, Ali. I really appreciate the time. Awesome. So we'll just kind of jump right in then. Can Absolutely. you give us just a brief overview of the municipal bond market and why it could make sense for investors to own municipal bonds right now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's certainly a great place to start. Um, so municipal uh, municipal bonds are really uh, bonds that are issued by cities, states, local municipalities, um, and they are really used to finance the majority of the education, infrastructure, and healthcare in this country. And so I, it's one of the things I believe, you know, regardless of political affiliation, we all can agree that those are things we need more of. And so um, as part of one of the benefits or one of the things to use to entice investors to invest in municipal bonds, um, they are federally tax exempt. So the income that is kicked off, the income produced by those bonds are federally tax exempt. And if you purchase bonds within your state, those can also be state tax exempt. Um, so it's actually a really great way to essentially finance a public good. You know, these are things shared across all the folks in the community. Um, and then it also has that added benefit, you know, with the tax exemption. Um, you know, it's become really important in times like now we are seeing, you know, government spending uh, stimulus on par with what we saw in 2008. And ultimately, you, myself, the, the, the folks uh, that you manage, uh, their portfolios for, you know, uh, we're the taxpayers that eventually get that bill. And so it's, um, you know, we joke that munis uh, municipal bonds have the only monopoly on tax exemption. Um, and so we, you know, we feel like there's always a time and place. Uh, it really has to do with, you know, the, the individual goals, um, but they are a low volatility, kind of high quality asset class. Um, and so there's a lot of different features that, that really make them attractive, especially in this, this type of environment. Mm -hmm. Dom, thank you. Um, tell us your thoughts on the COVID-19 pandemic's effects on the municipal bond market. There seems to be a lot of misinformation, specifically around bankruptcy. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so if we think about what's been different this go around, you know, if we look back uh, six months or a year, um, I think there was an anticipation of an economic slowdown. However, what we have seen with COVID is an economic shutdown, you know, in line with nothing seen before. And so really um, to have that economy come to a screeching halt, um, it has had a, a pretty drastic effect on the revenue side um, for the municipalities. And so if we think about um, typically munis or municipalities have like three core revenue streams, it's either the property tax you pay, the sales tax we pay, or it's a tax on income, uh, personal income tax, you know, that could be at the city, state, or like county level. Um, and so to have those things, again, kind of come to a screeching halt, people aren't out buying things. Um, you know, the, the one that's been the most resilient is property taxes. Um, and then if, if we think about what is used to finance, uh, you know, what municipal bonds are used to finance, they are toll roads, ports, um, even in some cases, stadiums, convention centers, um, and so uh, airports as well. And so uh, you know, with the economy coming to a screeching halt, you also had what occurred, you know, with travel and things like that. And so we have seen a, a very dramatic fall, uh, decrease in revenues. Um, it's been really dramatic for kind of single site projects. So this would be an example of a toll road um, that has been pretty dramatic just because of the lack of travel. There's been mm -hmm. other areas like states um, that are a little bit more resilient in cities. Um, but but it, it's the fact that we went from, you know, full speed ahead to zero that was so dramatic. It wasn't a slow right. progression. Um, and so that has brought up a, a lot of conversation. And, and one of the things that gets thrown around a lot is bankruptcy. And so, um, you know, bankruptcy within the municipal bond market is, is very unusual. And it's very unusual for a couple reasons. Um, the first is states are not allowed by law to file bankruptcy. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because a state is a perpetual entity. Uh, you know, we might not like the state of California or whatever, but, you know, they can't just close their doors and, and shut up, shut up shop and go away. Right. Right. So um, that that function doesn't really work. So and then within the states, the 50 states, only 27 of them allow 
cities or counties to actually file bankruptcy. And so, um, you know, there's a question about whether the means <clears throat> or, or legal uh, legal ability is even there. Um, you know, we certainly have seen uh, bankruptcies in, in our market, but municipal bond market really can be kind of thought of in, in another three different ways. And the first would be those general governments, your city, your state, your county. Um, there is also essential service utilities. So think of your water, um, water and sewer, or even electrical power. Um, again, those those two areas are perpetual entities. Um, and uh, the third part of our market is what we would consider kind of competitive enterprises. So this could be a hospital or a stadium or something along those lines. Um, it's very rare that we see any bankruptcies really in, in the general government or essential service. Uh, really the most recent, um, you know, at least in the continental US was Detroit. And, uh, you know, that occurred years ago. And, and Detroit was a story that played out over 30 years. You know, these things don't happen overnight. And so, um, you know, the bankruptcies tend to be centered in a specific part of our market. So, you know, with what we do here, uh, we avoid below investment grade or high yield bonds for, for that very reason. Uh, you know, we look for low volatility. We don't want to have to guess on whether that, you know, what, what's going to happen in that, in that regard. Um, and then, you know, the, the other thing to think about with, um, with bankruptcies in, in particular, you know, there was, um, in, uh, Mitch McConnell made some comments kind of to, to start all of this again, ignite all of this again. And uh, he was talking specifically about overburdened states in terms of debt overburden. And when you look at it, um, the states, for example, are really not overburdened by debt. They're overburdened by future pension liabilities. And what we have found through uh, most recently Puerto Rico, as well as uh, Detroit, is that bankruptcy is not an effective way to eliminate those pension obligations. And in fact, we found in Detroit that pensioners were made whole. They ru received roughly 100 cents on the dollar. And in fact, it was the general obligation, the unlimited GO claim that was subordinate to pension holders. So they received about 37 cents on the dollar. And so, um, you know, in our minds, it's actually, um, you know, not a great way to do things. The incentives could be questionable. You know, you could see a state running up a ton of debt, claiming bankruptcy and doing it over again. Um, but along, but, but also, you know, there's, there's the whole issue of the legality. Um, and then also, does it really solve the problem? And the answer is no. So, you know, in our minds, now more than ever, um, it's become very important to really understand the revenue sources of that municipality um, and really understand the resilience of those. Um, and then it also really, uh, you, you know, you want to put a lot of time and effort into the expense side of the ledger as well. Um, ultimately, uh, you know, the states, for example, um, are required to balance their budget, uh, unlike the, the, the federal government. Uh, so there's a fiscal discipline that's, that's enforced on them that, that really helps to solve some of those problems or alleviate some of those concerns. But, but ultimately, it's not an effective way to, uh, to solve the problem. Makes a lot of sense. So, you know, I know you mentioned toll roads and I assume certainly stadiums and, you know, kind of a, a couple of these other municipal bond kind of sectors that would I would assume would kind of be challenged in this environment. But are there any other, you know, kind of specific areas that are more affected than than others, more, you know, specific municipalities or other type of, uh, you know, type of bonds that you're seeing under a little bit more stress? Yes, yes, absolutely. So there's um, there's a couple of things to think about. Um, within our market, there is a portion of it which is high yield. Um, and that segment of our market was really a, a small, very small part. So the municipal bond market is about $4 trillion. Uh, if we go back to 2008, there was only about $30 billion total in that section, the high yield section. And what we find there is um, things that in, in many cases don't look or smell like muni bonds. Um, they are what we would almost consider kind of corporate uh, or private equity types of deals that are being done. And so within that area in particular, there are some, some, um, some municipalities or, or specific parts of that market that are very stressed. The first would be uh, what, are what are considered continuing care retirement centers. So we call these CCRCs. And it's the idea, it's, um, it's, it's not a nursing home, it's one of the, it's one of the uh, facilities where you start off in independent living, then you can go to assisted care, and ultimately if you, if you need to, uh, you can move to you know, further on down the line, so to speak. Um, those were really the epicenter uh, when the whole COVID uh, crisis started to break out, the pandemic broke out. Um, we saw the, really the nursing homes and continuing care re retirement centers were areas that were really challenged uh, because of the patient deaths and things like that. 
Um, they have come under a lot of stress. We have seen quite a few um, defaults already occurring. Um, again, it's an area that we, by and large, try to avoid because it's it's really kind of a flip of a coin. Um, there's some other areas, um, you know, we can think of what's happened with travel. Uh, so airports are a great example. Um, okay. Now, what's interesting about our market is there are 80,000 issuers, and you can compare that to 8,800 8, stocks listed in the world. So it's very fragmented. So it really, it's about doing your homework. But what we find is that, you know, in our market, it's very difficult to, to paint with a broad broad brush. And a perfect example of that is airports. Um, you know, airports were immediately an area of concern because of the, the, the decline in travel. Um, it was drastic and it was immediate. And what we did in, in doing our research, doing our homework, is we found there's a very big difference between different uh, certain airports. And a great example is Orlando, Florida, and Dallas, Fort Worth. Orlando, Florida is a destination and origination. You know, most folks go there to go to Disneyland uh, and then you go home. Dallas, Fort Worth is a hub. People are flying through it constantly to get somewhere else through connections. They're going and using the concessions. Also, more importantly, there's cargo that is going through there. And so you find a very different type of profile for those two types of airports. And so it's a great example of, you know, one we sold and one we bought. Um, another area that, that has been interesting is the ports. Um, you know, this has started originally from uh, the pandemic started originally with China. So there was a really steep decline in uh, imports on the West Coast. So that hit um, specific ports like Long Beach in California or in Seattle. Um, and then also, if you look to, let's say, the port of Miami, it's actually the largest cruise port. So what we did is, you know, um, made sure we didn't have any of the exposure in the two that I mentioned. Instead, we looked for a port like what we saw in Chesapeake Bay in Virginia, which is the largest importer from Europe. And so, you know, it was a way to not only run to protect yourself, but it was a way to be proactive and really take advantage of things um, and take advantage of what the market gave us. And it's a great example of something that we were able to do. Um, you know, the last thing I would mention is that, you know, um, because of the misconception in our market in regards to states and bankruptcy and the challenges facing states, um, there's been a pretty pretty great opportunity for us in particular in that area. So, um, you know, the state of Illinois is a great example of a state that um, everyone knows is challenged. Um, you know, they have had, you know, a succession of governors that have ended up in jail. Um, they have, you know, a lot of do other issues. Um, but what you find is that the state of Illinois actually has a very educated uh, workforce. Um, on top of that, their problems are really pension issues. You know, these are future uh, liabilities. And the truth of the matter is we don't believe that they will go bankrupt, uh, let alone go bankrupt anytime soon. And so uh, during the initial uh, crisis breakout in, in March, we actually had the ability to buy Illinois state GOs um, at 6% tax-free uh, with a seven-year maturity. And so, you know, for a client in a top tax bracket, that's almost 10% think about where interest rates are now. And, uh, you know, despite the fact that, again, Illinois has challenges, if Illinois was its own standalone country, it would have the 20th largest GDP in the world ahead of Switzerland. So it just goes to show you that, you know, it's, it's about doing your homework. It's about understanding the nuances of it. Um, you know, even within specific issuers, there are nuanced differences. And so um, there are some areas uh, that we're, you know, that we've already kind of tried to navigate around. Um, but, you know, we would expect there to be continued headline risk or headline noise, um, you know, there, that happens a lot. And really for us, uh, it creates opportunity and, and something that, you know, benefits our clients uh, for, for the near term and long term. Perfect. Well, Dom, I'm from Illinois um, and we have a handful of clients who uh, are a part of those pension plans. So this is all good news. I'm definitely right. going to at least this piece of the clip to each of them so hopefully they, exactly. they feel yep. good about that yep. um i think they'll be well and let me let me comments. add something on the yeah well and i'd like to add something real quick uh, because I, I think it's important so the pensions uh in particular are something that um you know for for a, for a manager who does bottom-up research so we are reading through the 180 200 page offering documents tr truly trying to understand the nuts and bolts that's really what matters um you know, the way that pension issues are presented in this country, and in some cases, I believe it's disingenuous. And it's it's disingenuous for a reason. And it's because the liabilities are aggregated together. 
And so you'll hear terms thrown around like, oh, you know, there's $10 trillion of unfunded pension liabilities. Well, the issue with those types of statements is that every pension is its own standalone entity. It can't, you know, uh, the city of Chicago has four different pensions, firefighters, police, teachers, and general employees. All four of them are funded at different levels. All four of them are their own entity. So there's specific people paying in, specific people who will be able to draw on them. They can't borrow, they can't you know, aggregate the assets together to invest, none of those things. And so really <clears throat> for, for uh, you know, a client that has the state of Illinois, you know, it's really about that individual pension plan to really understand. Um, and then the other thing I like to mention, uh, or like to talk about is um, the misconceptions around you know, who's doing well and who's not. Um, you know, a, a great example of that is if you have the choice between the city of New York and the city of Denver, and I told you one of them's 100% funded and one of them has a pension that's 40% funded, most folks would say Denver's 100 and New York is 40, and it's actually the opposite way. Um, you know, Dallas is another great example of a city that has uh, benefited immensely from this 10-year bull market or 11-year bull market, uh, but again, it's under 40% funded. So, um, you know, it's it's this is uh, this is really what we do day in and day out is try to understand this. You know, it is a very uh, fragmented market. Um, you know, it is is uh, highly diversified in the sense of issuers and nuances. And so, um, you know, I, I hope that that uh, gives some solace or at least lets them know that you know don't get caught up in the noise that you hear at the high level. It's really about kind of digging in and understanding that specific uh, pension that you, that they're uh, they're part of. Yeah, that makes absolutely. A lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So I guess to shift gears a little bit, Dom, um, you know, what hit headlines here in April, May was that the Fed stepped in to be a buyer of corporate bonds, right, to yep. support the market and provide liquidity. So what is, you know, the Fed and Congress doing to support states and local municipalities? So this is, a, this is actually a great question because it is one of the things that probably concerns us the most. Um, and it is the fact that investors are um, have misunderstood what is being done in our market. And so um, I may not have mentioned this earlier, but the municipal market is highly dominated by individual retail investors. Um, you know, corporations don't benefit from the tax exemption, so they're not huge buyers, but over half of our market is still owned by individual, uh, individual, individual investors who tend to buy the bonds, clip the tax-free coupon, and reinvest those dollars. And so um, what you see is that uh, uh, the market tends to overreact both to the upside and the downside. And that's really what we saw in March. There was a run on the bank, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, we had record outflows that occurred in back-to-back -back weeks that were four times larger than the previous weekly records. So $20 billion. And really that spike in outflows caused all of us managers to do the same thing, which is to try to sell their highest quality, uh, shortest maturity paper. And when that occurred, cash rates went up. So at one point uh, in, in back in March, we had um, bonds that were one day maturity that were yielding almost 7% tax-free. It was probably the best asset in the world at that time. And so right. what the Fed did is they stepped in and created a facility that allows municipalities to, le uh, allows them to lend to municipalities um, who can't uh, find a reasonable rate in the market. One example just happens to be Illinois is one of the few that have tapped that. Um, that was enough to really quell investor fears. Things have settled down. Uh, you know, then the Fed instituted their zero interest rate policy, which has brought rates down across our market. Um, what they are not doing in our market is buying individual bonds or individual high yield issues or high yield ETFs. They are not buying, they're only lending within our market. And so what I like to say is they are not, the Fed has not created a price floor, nor have they created a credit backstop. And that credit backstop is really important because it leads me to the second part of your question, which is what is Congress doing or not doing? So when Congress passed the CARES Act, which was the first stimulus package, Wrapped up in that were reimbursements for COVID-related costs, and so um, healthcare is a great example of a part of our uh, part of the uh, economy that is financed through our market. So a lot of hospitals, hospital systems, uh, most hospitals, their you know kind of margins, their profits are driven by elective surgeries, and they essentially had to stop those for several months. 
And so what we see is the Congress is, a, is essentially reimbursed them for those, for those costs that they incurred for treating the patients, but they haven't made up for those lost revenues. And those lost revenues are really the biggest concern going forward. It's in the hundreds of billions, potentially trillions of dollars that essentially evaporated because of the economic shutdown. Now, um, we had had hope that, that the Congress was going to pass a sec second stimulus bill. Um, but what we found is it's actually been kind of locked up and uh, derailed in the Senate. Um, and in particular, you know, the Republicans had the uh, felt as though they wanted to allow the first stimulus to take effect, right? These things take some time and, uh, you know, certainly makes sense. Um, and at the same time, you know, it also makes sense to let's wait and see maybe what the true impact is. Um, on the other side, the Democrats wanted to, you know, provide the stimulus before things got too bad, which also makes a ton of sense. And they were going off of projections. And with this being an election year, uh, you know, and with a lot of things at stake, um, I think that it's become a little bit difficult for one party to cede, you know, a victory to the other. So there's a good chance this happens, you know, to, this may happen to ride, uh, we may have to ride this out through November. Um, and the last piece of this puzzle, which is really kind of the interesting thing about how our market operates. Municipalities or munis, um, they only have to file financials once a year. In the corporate market, you have to file quarterly. And mm -hmm. you have a pretty tight deadline with which you have to deliver those. So typically, I think 30, 45 days. Within our market, not only do you file once a year, the municipalities have between 180 and 270 days to deliver those financials. Most uh, municipalities have a fiscal year that ended June 30th. So it could easily be January 1 of 2020 or the end of the first quarter before we actually have a full understanding or of the impact that this economic shutdown has had. And so, you know, when you take those three things into account and kind of add them up, um, it creates a situation where, you know, we feel as though we'd rather err on the side of caution. Uh, you know, this market has always been about, uh, you know, kind of keeping our clients wealthy, not making them wealthy. Uh, you know, this is not a market that delivers 300% returns. This is a market that allows you to sleep at night to know that you have tax-free income that's going to show up. And if you do it correctly, you know, defaults are extremely rare. Uh, in our market, triple B munis, which are the lowest level of investment grade, uh, default at a rate equal to triple A corporate credit. So those are the apples of the world. Okay. And so, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very resilient. They have monopolies in many cases. You know, you only have one water and sewer in your local area, um, but there is a level of, you know, the due diligence that needs to be done and credit research and understanding. Um, and so, again, just given the precarious situation that we're in and the kind of lack of support, so to speak, and the mis misconception about what's going on, um, you know, we, we, we definitely are trying to be prudent with our clients' money and, and you know, be uh, good stewards and, and, and err on the side of caution because there are a lot of questions in terms of how these things ultimately will play out. Right. Dom, if I can, if I can follow up briefly, I'm reminded um, coming out of the recession in after 2009, uh, the Build America bond program uh, was a pretty big deal. And while those bonds were taxable, those, yep. inter those interest payments were partially subsidized uh, by the federal government, providing, if not a guarantee, uh, possibly an implied guarantee. And it seems that that program worked well. Has there been any talk of any programs like the Build America bond program? coming back yeah yeah so um it's kind of funny that you bring that up because um, we're seeing some changes in the market dynamics um, that have to do with the taxable not necessarily the build america so um just for for any clients who, who aren't familiar because it was a very kind of short-lived one-year program through the obama administration and um you know at that time our market uh the municipal bond market was was kind of uh, having having trouble attracting investors and in particular it was because of the retail dominance and the headline risk that was out there was enough to scare people away so one of the ideas that the obama administration had was let's issue tax of, uh, let's allow them to act uh, issue taxable bonds we will subsidize the interest payment either to the investor or to the municipality so the cost is effectively the same but by making these taxable we'll broaden the investor base um, you know, the implied guarantee, which um, is, is funny, you kind of say it that way because that is uh, how it was uh, understood by most investors, but really that only had to do with the income subsidy or the interest rate subsidy. Um, you know, they weren't necessarily guaranteeing the credit worthiness. 
Um, and, and there are actually now a couple, you know, 10, 12 years later, there are some, uh, some of those bonds that were issued that are running into problems. And this question actually has come up. Um, what we're seeing now <clears throat> is um, municipalities or muni bond yields are actually higher than treasury rates, treasury yields. And it's typically the opposite. Because of the tax exemption, uh, the yields are typically lower. It kind of makes, you know, makes mathematical sense. Um, but because that's not the case right now, what we are actually seeing is that municipalities are electing to issue taxable bonds because it's equating to a, a savings for them. And so while I would not expect a resurgence of the program itself, there actually has been a resurgence in taxable issuance uh, because of that kind of interest rate disparity that's occurred. Um, and so it, it will be interesting to see, you know, that has reduced supply from the tax exempt side. It's also brought in other buyers, like I mentioned, the program, uh, Build America program uh, had, had targeted it. We're seeing that. Um, we're actually getting uh, interest from foreign investors who in no way benefit from the tax exempt nature, but they're coming to munis because munis are low volatility, they're low default, uh, they're very steady eddy, you know, and all these other uh, positive attributes. And so um, it will be interesting to see how that, that plays out because it has had a little bit of an effect from a supply side on, on what's occurred in the market. Okay, thank you, thank you. Well, Dominic, as we're wrapping up, what should we be thinking about? I mean, we've covered a lot of ground, but what else should we be thinking sure. about? What questions do um, we need to be asking on behalf of our clients? And just briefly, why why does this ultimately make sense in an, in an allocation to a portfolio? Why active management? And of course, tell us, why Thornburg? Yeah, no, absolutely. So a um, couple things to think about. Um, you know, municipalities or, or excuse me, muni bonds are a long dated high quality asset class. And so if you think about it, if you are building a water and sewer, you're going to issue bonds for 30 years, not five. Um, and our market has always been, um, you know, the, the farther out in, in maturity you go, the more income that you earn. And so by kind of the structure of our market, with it also being a low default um, asset class, uh, what, what, what you find is that there is a uh, kind of level of stability. Um, and then also, depending on clients, ultimately their goals, um, you can really serve a lot of different needs, whether it is, you know, right now where you have money market funds earning you a basis point. Um, you know, there, there are some attractive areas within our market to, for that next step out for cash that may not be used for, for two to five years. Um, for those clients who just need income and want to, you know, keep their tax liability low, um, there's that as well. And so, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different problems we can solve from an from investor standpoint. Um, but really now more than ever, uh, due to the fragmented nature of this market, um, you really need somebody to do that work for you. Um, you know, with there being 80,000 issuers and over a million different QCIPs, there are so many nuanced differences right. um, that, you know, really our team, uh, you know, that's what we do day in and day out is credit research to try to understand what it is. There's also an interconnectivity that, that is really, um, really kind of different in a way. Um, and a great example of that is, you know, folks who have bought local bonds that maybe is their city. Uh, Houston is an example of one that we owned where if you didn't do your homework, you may have bought a bond that was issued by the city that was backed solely by hotel tax, not something you want when travel dries up. Um, and so, so it's really about doing your, doing your homework. Um, and then, you know, the way that we uh, run our strategies, you know, there's a couple different ways to do it, but now more than ever, uh, mutual funds really make sense. And it's for a couple reasons. The first is you have an immediate diversification. So our strategy, our limited term strategy, for example, we have um, over 1,100 bonds, 1,400 issuers. So instant diversification. Secondly, it's, in, it's immediately invested. So you start earning that dividend on day one. Um, and then we like to ladder our bonds, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years out, so on to 10. And we wait the, the, the maturities depending on where we see the opportunity. And then we tend to buy and hold, you know, in our market, only the income is tax exempt. So in a way, uh, investors have been focusing on the wrong thing, kind of in our opinion. They've been watching their bond prices mm -hmm. go up, which mathematically means your income is going lower. Now, that's fine in a taxable bond where you're going to pay taxes on the income or the capital gain. 
Uh, but in our right. markets, you have that choice, right? So we would rather have higher levels of income and no capital gains. Um, <clears throat> and so really what, what, what you do um, by, by uh, investing in a strategy like the one that we have, the one that we manage, because we ladder our bonds, because we tend to buy and hold, we have bonds that we have owned for nine years. And interest rates were much higher nine years ago. And so what you can find in today's market is if you were to go out and buy a 10-year AAA bond today, it would pay you 70 basis points or 0.7%. Right. Our 10-year laddered strategy today is yielding you 180, 1.8% tax-free. And so it's the ability to have season holdings, to have higher yields. Um, and then more importantly, um, if for some reason a client you know, gets a little jittery or is, is uncertain or whatever that may be, um, you have the ability to sell and, and you're out immediately. Uh, we always say, you know, you have daily liquidity. Now, you may not like the price that you get that day, but you have daily liquidity. Uh, in many cases, muni bonds, really all bonds, are, are kind of like a home in the sense that it's sure. a bid ask. Uh, you know, you, you can't just, you know, whatever the value is on Zillow today doesn't necessarily mean that what that's what a buyer is going to pay you. And it may be weeks or months before that shows up. So, um, again, a lot of different little nuances, but uh, there's there's a lot of huge advantages right now to you know, both looking at munis, if you anticipate tax rates going up, you know, eventually we'll get the bill. Um, you know, the fact that they have always been very resilient, have those uh, those parts of the market that we focus on, uh, you know, and then the ability to earn a very attractive yield where our strategies are yielding anywhere from 1.8. Uh, we have one that's yielding almost 3% tax free. For a client of high tax brackets, you are talking about a rate, uh, an interest rate that hasn't been seen in a decade. You know, it's it's been a long time uh, for any of your clients or like myself, who was around prior to 2008, uh, you know, 06, 07, you could get a money market fund that had a 5% yield. Right. That is unheard that. of now. Yeah. And so really, you know, the interest rate policy that, that's been enacted by the Federal, uh, the federal Reserve has unfortunately been, uh, you know, punishing savers. Um, you are not being rewarded for being a saver. You're being punished. You're being forced to go out uh, the risk spectrum. Um, and so we, you know, we have a very specific need that we fill for those conservative clients um, who who want to you know lim try to limit their their tax liability uh, from an income standpoint? Certainly, and that's that's why we've hired Dornberg. And and with that, Dominic, um, Ali, and I, on behalf of our clients, want to thank you uh, for participating, providing mm -hmm. this insight that's so timely and much needed. Um, and to you, our clients, thank you for um, thank you for watching. Thank you for being part of this as well. If at any time there is a topic or concerns that you have that you would like us to cover in a video, please let us know that. Of course, keep in touch with us. Follow our blog at hdws.com forward slash blog. Uh, Dominic, again, thank you. Thank you, Thornburg. Um, Allison, thank you. Thank you. And we will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm.